Welcome to Real Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about effective nuclear charge. We're going to do three things really. First, I'm going to introduce what effective nuclear charge is. Then I'm going to talk about how you can calculate it. And lastly, we're going to go over the periodic trends for effective nuclear charge. Okay, so what is effective nuclear charge? Well, what we're thinking about here is what charge is felt by the valence electrons. And the valence electrons are the outermost electrons. So you can see here that we have lithium. It has two core electrons. Those are in the 1s orbital. It has one valence electron. That's in the 2s orbital. And if we think more carefully about what's going on here, we can see that we're going to have a repulsive force between our electrons. And we know that. But that means that the core electrons actually repel that valence electron. Meanwhile, the nucleus with positive charges is pulling that valence electron in. So there's really a tug of war here between the core electrons, which push that valence electron away, and the uh, protons, which pull that valence electron inwards. So now you can see I've used red and green arrows to represent these attractive and repulsive forces. So the nucleus is pulling in, and those core electrons are pushing away. And that means that our outermost electron doesn't feel the full positive charge of the nucleus because some of those electrons are pushing back on it. An effective nuclear charge is all about thinking how much of the nucleus really affects that outermost valence electron. So remember, valence electrons are repelled by the core electrons. And we call that repulsion shielding. So we'll call that repulsion shielding because those core electrons, those inner electrons are shielding the outermost electron from feeling the nucleus's charge. And you could think, okay, if we want to calculate what the effective nuclear charge is, we need to take into account how much things are pulling that electron in and how many things are pushing that electron away. And that's exactly what this equation down here does. It says the effective nuclear charge is equal to the number of protons, that's what's pulling the uh, valence electron in, minus the number of core electrons. That's what's pushing that valence electron away. So we're thinking here just about the valence electron, and we want to know how much of that nucleus's charge does it feel. Okay, now I'm going to show you how we calculate that. Now, I've broken this process into three steps. The very first thing we're going to do is write the electron configuration. And we're going to do that because that lets us count our core and valence electrons. And we have to know how many core electrons we have if we want to use our equation. Now, for lithium, you probably already know how many core electrons we have because we were just looking at it. But I'll go ahead and write the electron configuration. Remember, we saw that there were two electrons in the 1s orbital, that inner ring. And that in the 2s orbital, the outer ring, there was one electron. That's what these numbers represent, the number of electrons. Meanwhile, these bigger numbers are what we call the principal quantum number. They're n. And so valence electrons are the ones with the highest n. So we see that is a 2 there. And that means that anything with a 2 any orbital with a 2, in this case, has our valence electrons in it. Meanwhile, our inner ones are at this lower number, this 1, and that's core electrons. If you're not sure how to write electron configurations, check out my video, Introduction to Electron Configurations, and then come back and watch this one again. Okay, so we have two orbitals, a 1s orbital and a 2s orbital. Our core electrons are the inner orbital, the 1s orbital. And there's two of them. So that means that we can say our shielding electrons, or s, is equal to 2. Meanwhile, lithium has three protons, which we can tell just from looking at the periodic table. So now if I want to calculate Z effective, all I have to do is subtract my protons, or subtract my shielding electrons from my protons. Three minus two gives me plus one. So that three comes from the number of protons, and the two comes from the number of shielding electrons. And that tells me that the valence electron, the outermost electron in lithium, feels a positive one effective nuclear charge. And that should make sense because there's three protons pulling it in, but two electrons pushing it away. Let's do another calculation. Here we have aluminum. And once again, we're going to start by writing the electron configuration. The electron configuration for aluminum is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then we go down to the 3s, which is also full. And then we have one electron and the 3p. Okay, so we need to figure out how many core electrons we have. Well, the core electrons, remember, are the electrons without the highest number. So what's the highest number you see in the string? We got ones, we got twos, and we got threes. So threes are our highest number right here. That means these guys are valence, and everything else is core. So 
What you do when you want to identify valence or core electrons is you look for the highest number you see in your electron configuration. Now we're not talking about the superscripts because obviously here you see the six, but that remember is telling us the number of electrons in the 2p orbital, not any information about that orbital. So we look for the highest big number. In this case, it's three. Those are all valence electrons, which means everything else, all of these guys are core. And so we can add those up. We have two, four, 10, 10 core electrons. So our S is equal to 10. And our Z, if we look down on the periodic table, is equal to 13. So if we want to calculate the effective nuclear charge, all we got to do is 13, the number of protons, minus 10, the number of core electrons. 13 minus 10 is going to give me a plus 3 effective nuclear charge. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate this a few times for elements that are all in a row. And you'll see an interesting relationship here. So we have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. They're all right next to each other, right here in the 2p row. So I'll write the electron configurations for them, which are 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. That's for carbon. Now, it's pretty easy once we have the carbon electron configuration to write the nitrogen. It's the same thing, only we add one electron to the, t, to the p orbital because we're just moving one spot over on the periodic table. And same thing for oxygen. We have 1s2, 2s2, and now 2p4. So what are we doing? Well, let's think about how many core electrons there are here. The highest number in these strings is 2. We have 1s orbitals and 2s orbitals and 2p orbitals. That means the highest number is 2. So our valence electrons are in the n equals 2 level. Here's our core electrons. Our core electrons are identical for all of these elements. We have two core electrons for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And that means that as we go left to right on the periodic table, we're adding valence electrons, but we're not adding core electrons. And we're also adding protons. Carbon has fewer protons than nitrogen, which has fewer protons than oxygen. And so that means when we go ahead and calculate our effective nuclear charge, we take the number of protons in each one minus two. So carbon has six protons, six minus two equals plus four. That's for carbon. For nitrogen, we have seven protons minus two equals plus five. And then for oxygen, we have eight protons minus two equals plus six. So you can see that what happens is we're adding protons. This number here is getting bigger as we go left to right on the periodic table, as we go this direction on the periodic table. And that makes our effective nuclear charge higher. We're not adding any more core electrons. Our two is staying the same. And that is how we can think about the periodic trend for effective nuclear charge. As we go left to right on the periodic table, we increase effective nuclear charge. And that's important. That means that we can just look at the periodic table and we can put elements in order based on their effective nuclear charge. Now, one thing to keep in mind, this trend doesn't apply so well in the D block. If you're not sure why that is, which I would assume you're not sure at this point, calculate the effective nuclear charge in the D block for a few elements and take a look. So this trend applies very well across the rest of the periodic table, but the D block, this block right here, it doesn't apply so well in. And that's actually true for a lot of our periodic trends. Things get a little weird there. Okay, so in general, our effective nuclear charge increases as we go left to right. It turns out it also increases as we go bottom to top. This is a little more complicated, and I'm not going to talk about this in detail. But basically, the idea here is, is as I go from bottom to top, my valence electrons are getting closer to my protons. And that means that they feel more of a charge. So the, nuclear the effective nuclear charge increases as we go left to right on the periodic table, and as we go from bottom to top. So these blue arrows tell you where it's increasing. And that means we can solve problems like this. This one says, put the following elements in order of increasing effective nuclear charge. And we have silicon, sodium, chlorine, and argon. And we don't have to calculate their nuclear charge. All we have to do is look at their position on the periodic table. So let's, let's find them first. We have, first of all, silicon, which is right here. All right, and then we have sodium, which is way over here. And chlorine, and also argon. Okay, so notice those four elements are all in the same row. And what we know is that as we go left to right, we get greater and greater effective nuclear charges because we're adding protons, but we're not adding core electrons. Okay, so 
what's going to have the lowest effective nuclear charge? If effective nuclear charge is increasing as we go this way, that means the lowest effective nuclear charge is going to be sodium because it's the farthest to the left. It has the fewest protons. Then as we proceed, we'll get next to silicon. And as we continue going to the right, getting stronger and stronger effective nuclear charge, we'll see chlorine and then finally argon. So that is the order of increasing effective nuclear charge. That's what we can do with periodic trends. Periodic trends are really powerful because instead of calculating four different effective nuclear charges, we can just write down the string of elements. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry on Effective Nuclear Charges. If you have any questions, please ask them below. You can also subscribe to receive updates about future Real Chemistry episodes.